Hello everybody and welcome to your lecture 22 for geologic history. This is your professor Dr. Hurt. We're going to be talking today about dinosaurs, okay, because we're doing life in the Mesozoic, so we finally get to dinosaurs, kind of the more interesting stuff, right? So uh, we're going to be talking about dinosaurs, but much more than that because there's a lot of big life advances that happened in the Mesozoic and we'll be covering them all, okay? So just a little reminder, we're, we're uh, focused here now, the Mesozoic, which is in the Phanerozoic Eon. Hope you know that by now. And we have the Mesozoic Era, and that era is broken up into three relatively easy periods, right? Because a lot of you have heard these before, Jurassic, like Jurassic Park. Triassic is the first period, Jurassic's the middle, and then Cretaceous is the last, okay? And it's also kind of easy because we start off 250 million years ago, and, then, and I, I like I like the Mesozoic because like every period is broken up about 50 million years. So we start off about 250 million years ago, go to 200 million years ago. We have the Jurassic, and then after again about 50 maybe not 50 million years, but 55 million years, we get the Cretaceous, and then the Cretaceous ends after um, well yeah not quite not quite 50 million years, but it ends at 60 million years. Okay, so 60 million years ago, 66 million years ago we had the Cretaceous ending, and that ended, of course, with the big meteor strike, okay? So that's what we're doing today, we're doing the Mesozoic, and just to kind of give you an overview of all the things that we have to talk about today, uh, there's a lot. Of course, we have um, dominance of reptiles on the terrestrial ecosystems, so, you know, actually looking in the continents, we start to see, and in the oceans too, we see reptiles, really, being king of the jungle. So, uh, you know, looking at this video here, you see all sorts of things. Um, some things are familiar, like snakes and, you know, kind of small lizards and things like that. But of course, they're dinosaurs and uh, they're all reptiles. And we'll be talking also about that meteor strike that came at the end of the Mesozoic, right? Um, we also see the evolution of mammals. So we see the Theraspids. I hope you remember Therapsids from the last lecture. Uh, they're the ancestors of reptiles. You might remember that um, Therapsids were, of course, reptiles, but uh, mammals are going to split off and develop from those Therapsids. So we see little, beginning of little mammals. Uh, most of them are monotremes and marsupials in the Mesozoic. Okay, And uh, we also start to see a really big deal. We start to see flowering plants. Magnolia trees, by the way, that you know and love today, are actually um, among the first plants that, to produce a flower. So magnolia trees are actually very ancient. We find magnolia trees in the fossil record in the Cretaceous very, very clearly, and they look almost exactly the same. So, you know, if you wanted to have an idea of what the dinosaurs were munching on, you can look at a magnolia tree. Okay, um, yeah, so there's, just speak of the devil, there's um, the magnolia fruit and uh, uh, you could see it's pretty pretty well preserved here from a Cretaceous age, uh, what looks like a silt stone, okay? Um, in the oceans, we see ammonites being uh, dominant. These kind of, might remember these big curled cephalopod, cephalopods are these big curled shells, spiraled shells. And we also see the advent, the coming of bivalves. And bivalves start to take over, and you're going to see brachiopods are going to, they are on their, brachiopods, they are on their way out. I'm going to draw a big red down arrow, and bivalves are on the way up, okay? So the clams, all those delicious shellfish that you eat, clams, oysters, mussels, they're all bivalves. They're different than brachiopods, they're not the same. We'll go over some of the differences later. And then... Uh, of course, uh, we have to talk about some mass extinctions because we are kind of sandwiched between two mass extinctions in the Mesozoic. Okay, the first, the first mass extinction is the PT mass extinction. That is the Paleozoic, or sorry, the Permian Triassic. Okay, so the uh, whoops, I made a B instead of a P. Permian Triassic. So that, so the Cretaceous, I'm sorry, the Mesozoic starts off with the Permian Triassic mass extinction. Um, and it ends, of course, with the KT stands for uh, Cretaceous. I know that Cretaceous starts with a C, 
but it has German origins, starts with a K, and you have uh, the KT, it's known as the KT mass extinction. Okay, and um, the K stands for Cretaceous, the T stands for tertiary, which is the first part of the um, Cenozoic, which we'll talk about next week. So the PT mass extinction was a devastating mass extinction. It is one of the most devastating mass extinctions, if not the most devastating mass extinction on Earth. It killed 95% of the marine species and probably 70% of the terrestrial species, going off the fossil record. So if we just look at the fossils, we see like 95% of the fossil species disappear all of a sudden from the oceans. 70% disappear from land. So what happened? Um, one of the big uh, indicators that we have about what happened are a lot of uh, very large flood basalt flows that occurred uh, right at this time period. We have, for example, example the Siberian Deacon Traps uh, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of other major flood basalt flows. That's what's kind of showed here, this basalt here. Uh, you could see these volcanic vents in the background. Uh, they were major, major, major volcanic events that dwarf what is going on in Hawaii. You know, we're talking about things that are a thousand times uh, what Hawaii is. And uh, we think that it caused some temporary climate change that was enough to really wipe out a lot of the species. So that's some ideas about what must have happened here. At the Permian-Triassic boundary, you can see uh, on the vertical axis here, you have a number of different families of species. Okay, and then on the um, horizontal axis you have time. Okay, so uh, you can see things go up and down. Of course, uh, at the, under the Ordovician, there's a big there's a big trough right here. It's a mass extinction. The end of the Devonian, there's a big trough. That's a mass extinction. But the biggest trough, you can all see this. The biggest trough is right here, with the end of the Permian, and the beginning of the Triassic. That's the PT mass extinction. And then you see things bounce back. Right, you bounce back. And uh, this is the KT mass extinction, right? And you can see that it's actually pretty small compared to the PT mass extinction, right? So PT was huge, huge, huge. So uh, taking a look at this in terms of fish, different fish populations. Uh, here we go. This is, this is the Permian right here. And then we see this explosion in biodiversity. This was the beginning of the Triassic, okay? So actually, this is all the Triassic just right here. 200 million years is the end of the Triassic. And uh, what you see is, yeah, a lot of fish species went extinct right here at the end of the Permian, but they bounced back. Notice that the pink color becomes dominant over the blue color. So the blue represents cartilaginous fishes. Those are your sharks and ray rays, things like skates and stingrays, uh, manta rays. Uh, the cartilaginous fishes, they're still around, of course. We have plenty of sharks in the ocean. But bony fish is what's shown in pink. You see, bony fish really took over after the PT mass extinction. Okay, so we start to see bony fish. So, ooh, some of those delicious. Actually, actually uh, hooked into a red fish just, just this morning, actually, as a matter of fact. Um, but uh, your delicious fish that we enjoy all, you know, plenty of them that come from Corpus Christi Bay, right? Uh, redfish, uh, speckled trout, and, and uh, black drum, and all the rest. Those are all bony fish, okay? They are part of the ray finned fish category, and they took over these fish that have mineralized skeletons, so they have hard skeletons, took over against the cartilaginous fishes, you know? So there's your black tip shark and, and stingray they are going to take a back seat now. Um, now, of course, these ones do not have mineralized skeletons. Uh, you know, sharks have, usually when you find the remains of sharks, you just find the jaws and the teeth, right? That's the only part that's mineralized. The rest of this is um, cartilage, right? It has a cartilage-like ske skeleton type thing. So bony fish took over in the Triassic, and cartilaginous fish took a back seat. Now, another thing that happened in the marine ecosystems during the Mesozoic is, uh, now, of course, we had um, ammonites coming into prominence 
during the Mes during the Paleozoic, but now they're really going to start to take over. Uh, these were just very, 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 very common in the Mesozoic. They are ammonites, um, amino, am, aminoidea. They are a class of cephalopods. So here, okay, kingdom, whoops, uh, uh, there we go. So the kingdom here, the phylum, the class, and the order, okay. The kingdom here is animal. The phylum is mollusk, mollusca. The class is cephalopod. And the order is um, aminoid idea. Okay, aminoids, um, ammonites, okay. So this is what they look like. They have a big curled shell. And you know, it's kind of funny because looking at these things, you're like, how did these things swim or did they swim did they crawl on the ocean floor or something um they do actually swim um their their shell even though it looks like big and bulky is actually filled with many different chambers filled with air and the creature the squid like creature squids and octopus by the way are part of the the cephalopod um class so uh, they're related to these creatures here. Uh, they're filled with their shells are actually filled with these different chambers of air, and just like a submarine that has ballasts and it can fill or empty its ballast tanks, um, a, you know these things basically work on the same principle. They either fill or they uh, they um, empty out their little chambers, and they're able to float and swim and uh, achieve neutral buoyancy so just kind of floating in the water whatever height they want they're pretty cool um, i'm going to show you just a little video of kind of how these guys a uh, kind of a i can say a distant cousin or maybe not such a distant cousin a close cousin of the ammonites now ammonites are extinct but we do have a close cousin who's still alive named the nautilus and nautiluses are still around um, they're kind of rare they're endangered just like a lot of old species typically have trouble competing against the newer species, but they're still around and they're pretty cool. So I just wanted to show you this neat video of them from put out by the American Natural History Museum. The American Natural History Museum is in New York City. And if you ever get a chance to visit the American Natural History Museum, I really suggest you do next time. If you ever are in New York, it's right there um, next to Central Park. It's a really cool place to visit. I'm, I'm looking up the videos right here. So here's, uh, here's uh, I guess, Neil Landman from the Na American National History Museum. I'll play it now. Nautilus, they're a unique group of animals. They've been around on our planet for the last five to 600 million years and have left a remarkable record. We don't have very much to compare it to because it's so different from all other modern cephalopods. Nautilus is the most primitive of all the cephalopods. The oldest squid that we have are 350 million years, but the lineage of Nautilus is probably about 500 million years old. Okay, so these guys, these Nautilids, were around in the Cambrian. You know, so it's pretty amazing. Um, very, very old creatures and a very successful design. You know, they've, they've really stood the test of time, right? So what makes Nautilus unique among all cephalopods today is this external shell. Back at the dawn of cephalopod evolution, probably all of them had shells. On the outside, it seems like it's a solid shell, but on the inside, you immediately detect that it's a series of chambers ever increasing in size until you come to the body chamber where the animal is lodged. So each of these chambers is filled with air during life, and that permits the animal to maintain neutral buoyancy as it grows. If you look at the early embryology, you'll see the same number of arm buds as other cephalopods, but they develop very differently, so that they develop into all of these tiny little tentacle-like structures called cirri, about a hundred little cirri. 
if you look at the squids, you think of them as lunging predators. Nautilus doesn't swim all that well. I mean, it swims perfectly well for what it needs to do, but it's not going to be doing these predatory lunging activities. It's going to scavenge along the bottom looking for dead animals. So it's a, a different mode of life. If you look at the common squid Luligo, it produces thousands of eggs. So each egg is very small. It's probably Okay, well, I think you get the idea. I just kind of wanted you to see some pictures, especially like how these things swim and move around because it's probably pretty similar, if not almost exactly the same as an ammonite um, might have done. So they're pretty cool. I want one. Um, they're, they're, unfortunately, I think they're endangered. But uh, anyway, going back here, they got really big. Some of these got really, really huge. Um, I don't know if they have any of these huge shells at the New York uh, American Natural History Museum, but they do, I know, at the Los Angeles uh, Natural History Museum. They got some of these really big ammonite shells, and you could see that they're like meters. Some of them are two meters in diameter, so six feet across. So they got huge. I mean, some of these things got huge. Uh, one of the things that sets the ammonites apart is the suturing between the shell, different shell segments. So uh, remember at last time we talked about belemnites. Um, so belemnites, you can actually tell the difference between an ammonite shell and a belemnite shell because of the sutures, the way that the, um, the, way that the shell is sutured together. And the ammonites have this wrinkled suture. Okay, so it's very, very characteristic of the ammonites. As soon as you see that wrinkled suture in a shell, you can say, that's an ammonite. Okay, and you know what's pretty cool is that when you find things like this, it immediately, it's kind of like an index fossil, you know, it kind of like immediately orients you to like, okay, we're probably, we're probably looking around in the Mesozoic, um, you know, maybe the late, maybe the late Paleozoic, so not, not necessarily, they are around the Paleozoic, but uh, they were very common in the Mesozoic, they were big Mesozoic marine animals, so there you go, the cephalopod, ammonites, right? Uh, so just like the extant nautilus, ammonites could swim. Their shells contain a series of chambers that could be emptied to maintain neutral buoyancy and float through the water like that, okay? So there you go, there's an extant nautilus and uh, very closely related, of course, to squids, cuttlefish, octopuses They're in the same, same phylum, okay? And the same order as well, cephalopod. So in the Mesozoic, um, another big change that was happening in the terms of life in the oceans is we see very different um, epifaunal suspension feeders. So epifaunal suspension feeder, that's a big mouthful. You're like, what the heck does that mean, epifaunal suspension feeders? Um, epifaunal means, um, means that they're living on the bottom of the seafloor, kind of like, uh, like benthic, right? Benthic means living on the bottom of the seafloor. Uh, planktonic means floating in the ocean column. Nectonic means swimming. Okay, so uh, epifaunal refers to creatures that are living on the bottom of the seafloor. If we go around and look at what do we find on the seafloor today, you know, we find a lot of oysters. Okay, uh, you can find oysters all over Corpus Christi. I know there's a really nice patch of oysters, and um, if you ever go down to Indian Point Pier, there's a lot of them there. You can actually um, harvest those ones, by the way. It's in a it's in a legal zone for oyster harvesting. Um, you know, you find things like crabs and clams. Uh, you find these things. Probably, probably most of you haven't seen something like this. It's called a sea squirt. It's actually a chordate, as a matter of fact. It's not a um, kind of looks like a coral or something, but it's not. But anyway, this is epifaunal kind of creatures of modern days. Okay, now um, we're going to see that at you know during the Mesozoic things start to kind of look a little bit more like they do in the modern day. So we start to see for the first time in the um, Mesozoic clams, mussels, and bivalves. So, uh, sorry, oysters. Now all of these are phylum mollusca and they are the class bivalvia, they're bivalves. These are very different, they are not the same as brachiopods. During the Paleozoic was brachiopod time, okay? When you find brachiopods in your rock unit, if you find a fossil in a rock of brachiopod, you're probably looking at something from the Paleozoic. You know, 99% of the time, you're looking at a Paleozoic rock. We do have brachiopods in the Mesozoic. We have brachiopods even today. These are living extant brachiopods. 
Remember, the way that you can tell the difference between a brachiopod and a bivalve is look at the shell. Um, you can see that clam shells and um, oyster shells and mussel shells, all bivalves, okay? They are not symmetrical, right, on either side of the shell like this. Do you see that? So it's not the same on either side. But brachiopods are. Do you see how it's a mirror image on this side as on this side? Okay, it's a mirror image on this side as on this side. And the same with these things, right? Okay, it's a mirror image, a mirror image. You got symmetry going right down the middle of the shell. So that's how you know brachiopods from bivalves, okay? So there you go. This is, this is a typical bivalve, okay? You could see that it doesn't have symmetry there, no symmetry, whereas you have symmetry going down. On the other hand, usually bivalves, which by the way means two, two valves, two shells, have symmetry across the two shells like that. So they're the same across the two shells, but not, um, not brachiopods, okay? So anyway, that's how you tell the difference uh, between brachiopods and bivalves. So bivalves really took over in a big way after the PT mass extinction. Brachiopods, which were dominant epifaunal species, benthic species, were mostly killed off. Not 100%, but mostly killed off. And our uh, big, beautiful bivalves took over. Okay, so that's why we have clams and oysters and things like that that are good to eat today. Um, kind of moving now into what reefs were like. So kind of like coral reef type situations. Now this is a coral reef from the, I hope you can all tell looking at this, that this is from the um, Paleozoic, right? It's actually from the Cambrian. So I hope that's like looking at this, you guys can tell that because um, on, the, on the final exam, you're gonna have pictures like this. I'm gonna give you pictures you know, showing, showing a scene from different time periods and you need to be able to recognize what you know what period it is maybe not exactly what period but at least you should be able to tell me what era like you should be able to tell me this is the ediacaran or this is the um this is the paleozoic or the mesozoic or the cenozoic you should definitely be able to do that so if you can't look at this picture and think this is the paleozoic then you need to go back and review that's all i can say so it's, you know, you have some really uh, big giveaways here. Trilobites were only around during the Paleozoic, okay? Um, so this, I don't even know what this is, but it's it's a Paleozoic, you know, crustacean of some kind. So anyway, uh, reef building species in the Paleozoic. So let's go over what we used to have in the Paleozoic. So remember we had, big time we had stromatoporides, which are porifera sponges, right? Porifera. Okay, down there. So these are the sponges. Big time reef builders during the Paleozoic. We have tabulate corals. We have rugose corals. Remember, these are solitary corals. So they were just living in one animal living in this thing, kind of look probably like a sea anemone, living out of this horn-shaped shell. We have bryozoans. We have brachiopods. However, uh, reef building species were really wiped out during the PT mass extinction. And instead, we, we take over with a new, a whole new phylum of animals. And this is kind of weird, but um, during the Mesozoic, the major reef building animal that took over were something called rudists. This is a rudist reef, fossilized, obviously, rudist reef, um, that is from Mesozoic times. So it uh, kind of looks like a bunch of like big tube worms or horns or weird kind of weird things right so this is a rudist reef rudists are actually bivalves they're actually related to clams they're in the same class and order as clams are so these are again kingdom is animal the phylum is mollusca the class is bivalve okay this is another picture of what they would have looked like, right? So these were these were the creatures that were building up the reefs. This little this little part is the other valve, okay? So it's kind of like a lid that would come off and open up and allow the animal to um, start suspension feeding, okay? That's what built up the reefs 
during this time. So here's another picture of what rudest animals would have looked like during the Mesozoic. Okay, we don't really have we don't really have anything that's exactly like rudists anymore. They went extinct. Now, um, on the coral side of things, so remember, rudists are bivalves or related to clams. You know, the phylum is mollusca. Uh, kind of going to the coral side of things, um, we had a new kind of a new kid in town. Okay, a new, uh, a new, a new comer. So that is the um, what are called the skeletarians, skeletinians. I'm sorry. Um, types of fossil or sorry types of coral so these are nidaria phylum nidaria they are a type of coral and they have what's called a radial symmetry so you can always tell uh the skeletinians from earlier kinds of coral like tabulate corals and rugos corals uh, you could tell the difference because they have this radial symmetry so you see how there's there's all these little septa that are splitting the um, coral into all these different parts, but it's all kind of around a central hub. You know, almost looks like a, a wheel, like a bicycle wheel, right? Or, you know, with a hub and spokes coming out of it. So that's how you know the skeletari uh, skeletinians. So um, uh, let's see. So that's uh, just kind of how the septa are arranged in uh, sc scleractinians. And uh, whenever you see these, it's an indication that you're kind of in, again, the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic. So most modern corals are these. They're the Scalarctinians. Okay. So um, that's kind of what was changing with reefs. You know, you got the new types of coral. We have the rudest uh, bivalves taking over reefs in the Mesozoic. What's going on also are changes in the planktonic life forms. So we don't think too much about plankton, but plankton is a very important uh, collection of organisms, makes up the base of the marine food chain. And plankton refers to basically any any organism that's planktonic. Planktonic means free floating. Okay, so it floats along with the tides and the currents in the ocean. So I'm um, just kind of give you an idea. There are four main groups of plankton. There are the form formini forminifera. The form, gosh, I always say, foraminifera. Foraminifera. Um, these are single-celled eukaryotic organisms that make calcium carbonate shells or calcite shells. Okay, so uh, that's one type. We also have coccolithophores. These are single-celled photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms that produce calcium carbonate shells. Okay, so these things are all microscopic. Okay, you can see they're very very small. Um, all microscopic. So these things um, float in the water column. There's trillions upon trillions and trillions of them. And every year their little bodies drop to the bottom of the seafloor. And that's what creates a lot of the sediment at the bottom of the seafloor. And that's how you get this collection of marine rocks, right? Especially limestones. I mean, these are actually, these things that you're looking at right now are the building blocks of limestones, okay? They are creating the limestones, creating chalk and other types of limestone. So. Um, another type of plankton that's very common are um, uh, diatoms. If you ever heard of diatomaceous earth, it's actually soil that is made out of diatoms. So these are single-celled photosynthetic organisms that make, instead of calcium carbonate shells, they make silica shells, okay? And they are dominant in cooler waters. So when you find uh, the silica-based, um, uh, the silica-based ooze, at the bottom of the seafloor, which pr is preserved into a rock called chert. Okay, it creates a rock called chert. It's an indication that those waters were relatively cooler than other places, okay, that perhaps were producing limestone. Um, a final group here are the dinoflagellates. So these are single celled eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms. Notice all these things are photosynthetic, okay, they're all just absorbing, absorbing the sunlight in the top kind of surface part of the ocean. And they produce organic shells. So these are not um, not kind of lithified, um, mineralized skeletons like those other creatures. They're dominant in warmer waters. These are what create, dinoflagellates are what create those bioluminescent waves, which you'll see from time to time in different parts of, of the um, 
both in our country and the United States, but also uh, a lot in Central America as well on the Pacific side. Um, I can even show you a picture. Uh, I, I brought up a video here from um, Sam Cle San Clemente. Um, I actually grew up around this, relatively close to this area. I mean, I used to go to San Clemente um, when I was a kid. So anyway, here's here's a surfer surfing in um, bioluminescent waves. So this is like real reality, you know, like things really happen. It's pretty incredible. So you could see the, the bioluminescence in the waves. Looks like it should be fake, right? It looks like that should be, you know, I don't know, man-made or some kind of special effects, but it's not. That's 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 really uh, all natural. So probably some of you, you know, I know some people, they take trips to like um, Costa Rica or places like that, and uh, you can find things like that. And you can find them here in our country as well, except they're more rare. So let's get back here. Those are dinoflagellates type plankton. Um, why they do that, I don't really know. I'm not a microbiologist, so I don't, I'm not exactly sure, but I just know that they do. So uh, another big thing that came along in the Mesozoic, there are also big changes happening to plants. So you might remember that at the end of the Paleozoic, we were getting land plant, well, I shouldn't say the end. I mean, we were getting land plants really in the beginning of the Paleozoic and the Ordovician. Uh, but we start to see land plants. So uh, land plants were at first like things like mosses, very simple ferns, but um, all spore producing, right? They, they reproduce with spores. Now we start to see something different. In the uh, Mesozoic, we're going to start to see gymnosperms uh, taking over. At, uh, by the end of the Paleozoic, we start to see gymnosperms taking over, which are things like conifers, ginkgos, like ginkgo biloba, if you've ever heard of that. They have these kind of leaves shaped like this and little fruit like that. Uh, we also see cycads. Cycads are, some people call them royal palms here. You've probably seen plants like this. They look like palm trees, but they're actually different. They're not, they're not true palms. Um, they're an older type of gymnosperm called cycads. So um, there's also these. I can't remember the name of these things. They're still around today. They, they're really cool. They only have two leaves. And the leaves never, instead of making more leaves, the leaves, the two leaves that it has never stop growing. So they can get these like really, they can get these like really, really, really long two leaves. They're weird. Um, I have to find out what those things are called, but I keep forgetting. So um, anyway, those are the gymnosperms. But in the Mesozoic, we're gonna see the expansion of gymnosperms. We're gonna see things like ferns and, um, and you know, non-vascular plants are gonna kind of take a back seat. And we're gonna see gymnosperms come into being. And finally, we're gonna see angiosperms. So angiosperms are really cool. They are all the things really that you love probably most about plants probably it's an angiosperm, okay? They produce fruit and flowers. So we had no flowers before we had um, before we had angiosperms. So angiosperms are fruit and flowering plants. Gymnosperms are, mean, gymno means naked seed. So gym, gymno, you know, like gymnasium means naked. Um, so gymno, the sperm means the seed. So naked seed. Um, angiosperms, I don't know what angio means. Hmm, not sure, but um, you know it has a flower and a fruit and a seed on top of it. So uh, you know before we had seeds, we had spores. So like things like ferns reproduce with spores, mosses reproduce with spores. So angiosperms produce fruit and flower, and they became very competitive, very well established. And now gymnosperms are kind of the backseat species and angiosperms are on top of the world. So all these things you see here before you, right? Grass, flowers, fruit, you know, tomatoes, cactus, um, apples, right? Bamboo, all this stuff, it's all angiosperms. So a lot of like the, you know, really successful species now are angiosperms. So. Um, you'll notice that also angiosperms were much more successful in desert environments. Like if you look at a desert environment like this one, everything you see is an angiosperm, you know? Think of the things that are gymnosperms, like they're like pine trees. They have a hard time um, dealing with very dry conditions. So angiosperms are also able to reproduce better and take over in kind of drier, 
drier conditions. So anyway, um, angiosperms have seed and a fruit compared to gymnosperms just have the naked seed. Um, many, many difference, differences actually between them. Here are all the differences between angiosperms and gymnosperms. You don't need to know any of this stuff, but um, I just kind of wanted to show you. Uh, there's a lot more than just the fruit, you know, but um, for the purposes of this class, it's enough to just know that angiosperms have fruits and flowers. Gymnosperms do not have, do not have those things. Okay. Now, a um, big thing that happened in the Mesozoic that you're probably excited about is time out, you know, dinosaurs and reptiles, right? So, uh, you, as you all know, Mesozoic was the time of the dinosaurs. So that's what was really going on in the in the Mesozoic, okay? Uh, as long as a lot of diversification of reptiles. So, you know, for the first time you can get things like turtles and all sorts of different types of lizards and uh, different types of uh, different types of reptiles. We really started to spread out and diversify during that time. So, uh, just kind of a reminder, remember that we started off when in the um, kind of the end-ish of the Paleozoic, we had the amniotes take over, so reptiles are part of the amniotes. They are different than amphibians because amphibians don't have an amniotic egg. And amniotic eggs mean that you have a, am, an amniotic sac surrounding the gestating you know, creature, the growing creature that's in there, little baby, whatever it is. Um, there's, a, there's this amniotic sac surrounding it and that keeps it in a liquid environment. So that's a big deal. I, I mean, actually, by the way, we're amniotes too, right? We have an amniotic sac that when we were in the womb and we were in mama's belly, we were surrounded by this amniotic fluid, right? Um, and that's the water, like when a mama's water breaks, she's about to have a baby, that's the amniotic fluid coming out. So it kind of keeps us in a artificial, I quote unquote artificial, um, like aquatic environment, okay? So before amniotes, all the amphibians were stuck in the water, they had to stay near water. And to this day, you know, amphibians, frogs, newt, salamanders, they have to stay near the water because that's how they reproduce. They can't reproduce without it, okay? So um, they don't, because why? They don't have an amniote. So the amniotes um, first split off into two different groups. So we had the um, sauropsids and the synapsids. So the sauropsids and the synapsids, okay? The synapsids gave rise to the therapsids, and the therapsids ultimately changed into the mammals. There are no living, today there are no therapsids left, okay? We don't have any therapsids. Um, we've all, you know, the only therapsids to have survived, eventually they, they evolved into the mammals, okay? So welcome, you know, you're, you're a mammal, right? So you're, you're related to these reptiles. You're related very closely, not very closely, but you're related to these therapsid uh, reptiles that I'm gonna be showing you um, pictures of a little bit. Um, now the, serap the sauropsids, soro means like lizard. So these are more like lizard-like. Uh, we have the anapsids and the diapsids. Anapsids, the only living extant relative of the anapsids are the turtles, okay? And the diapsids gave rise to everything else that you see here. So the diapsids, let's talk about the diapsids. We have all the, the um, uh, marine reptiles, the giant marine reptiles of the Mesozoic, they're extinct now, okay? But the mosasaurs, and, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the Plesiosaurus and the Ichthyosaurus, okay? Um, those marine reptiles, they're now extinct. Um, but lizards, you know, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, uh, as well as the dinosaurs and the pterosaurs, right? The flying, big flying lizards, uh, those now extinct were, were part of the diapsid line. Birds, still living today are part of the diapsid line. Okay, so we have these three main groups that you should all know, the anapsids, the diapsids, and the synapsids. We are basically from the synapsid lineage. Birds, lizards, snakes, modern day reptiles are either from diapsids or anapsids. The only living 
uh, members of the anapsids are the turtles. So turtles are kind of on a group by themselves, whereas all these other creatures that we know and love today are all kind of more clump closely, they're closer together, okay? They're more closely related, okay? So there you go. You have the ancestral amniotes, whoops. Okay, the ancestral amniotes split off into the therapsid, synapsid lines. The anapsids gave us the turtles, and diapsids, everything else is diapsids. So these are just some of the main groups of reptiles. So I'm just gonna take you through and look at the main groups of either reptiles or things that are um, re like related and originated from the first amniotes. Really, I shouldn't say reptiles, how about this? We're gonna go through all the amniotes. We're gonna look at just all the main amniote groups. Things that are in um, bold are, uh, things that are in bold are, um, they're uh, still alive today, they're extant. So mammalia, mammals, obviously extant, they're still living. Lizards and stakes, which are the squamata, still extant, living today. Um, now notice they put turtles, this group puts turtles here under a diapsid. So that's actually, it's, it's actually up for debate whether turtles are anapsids or diapsids. We're not exactly sure. Um, crocodiles put under, you know, um, diapsids. And these are, by the way, um, crocodiles along with birds are basically the closest reptile, closest relatives to dinosaurs today. So crocodiles are part of the archosaurs and uh, dinosaurs originated from archosaurs. So, you know, early dinosaurs probably looked like crocodiles, basically. Whereas later dinosaurs probably looked more like birds. Okay, and by the way, some people consider, some paleontologists consider birds to be dinosaurs. In fact, sometimes they talk about the extinction, not of the extinction of the dinosaurs, but the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. Okay, so without further ado, let me go through, just kind of give you an intro to some of these things. So mammals, you know what mammals are, right? They're things that, amniotes that have hair, and but most of all, they are mammals. They have mammary glands, which are milk glands, like mal mammary is in mama. You know, you can actually see the word mama there. Like, you know, mama, like your mama, right? So uh, your mother, milk, okay? That's, that's where mammary and mammal comes from. Um, Plysosaurs, right? These are these kind of like things almost look like the Loch Ness Monster. Very, very big in the Mesozoic, but have obviously gone extinct now, we, at least they say, unless Loch Ness Monster is real. Um, ichthyosaurs were pretty cool. They were uh, marine reptiles, look a lot like dolphins, modern day dolphins today, but they were reptiles, okay? Um, these are pretty cool. These are um, Toraras, which are part of, um, they're the only, to this day, they're the only, there's only like one place on earth where you get these, I think they're like in Papua New Guinea or something like that, one of those little islands in the South Pacific. But um, these Tarataras are, um, or Tararas, sorry, are uh, uh, on, in a group of their own. They're actually in a group of their own. They look maybe like iguanas or something like that, but they are not related to them at all. They are not, they're not a type of lizard, believe it or not. Like looking at there, you're like, that's a lizard. No, it's not a lizard. So lizards are in the squamata group. They're in the same group as snakes, right? Um, different from Tararas. Um, okay, turtles, you know, again, I said, it, we're not sure if really turtles are diapsid or anapsid. We're not exactly sure where the lineage takes off. Um, crocodiles, pterosaurs were these flying, flying reptiles. And then we have two types of dinosaurs. We have the um, ornithischian dinosaurs and the saurichisian. Um, dinosaurs. Okay, so or ornithischian means um, bird-like hips. Saurischian means um, lizard-like hips. Ironically, birds come from the lizard-like hips, not the bird-like hips. Dinosaurs. Kind of weird. So, um, just an example: um, ornithischian dinosaur was like Triceratops. Ceratopsians were <coughs> um, bird-hipped. And things that like were Sorchisians were things like T. Rex and like the um, you know Velociraptors and things like that. Um, we'll we'll get into all that then. Of course, you know birds today. Obviously, there's some birds that look a lot like dinosaurs, right? So um, most of them don't, but some of them really look a lot like them. So 
Anyway, uh, at the Permian Triassic, reptiles were divided into those three main groups, the synapsids, the diapsids, and the anapsids. You can actually tell the difference between these th three groups based on skulls. So the skulls were um, different. It actually refers to the number of um, holes uh, behind the orbit, like the eye orbit, okay? So the anapsids. The anapsids we think were the earliest group. It possibly includes the turtles. Turtles, turtle skulls look like this, by the way. Um, but the anapsid skulls you'll have, you'll see, have no holes. Okay, so anapsid means no, no hole, right? No, no opening behind the eye orbit. Okay. Diapsid skulls. Now these are going to be things like lizards, snakes, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, crocodiles, dinosaurs, pterosaurs. Diapsids have two openings in the back of the skull. Synapsids, therapsids, pelicosaurs, mammals, all these creatures like this have one, one opening. Syn means one opening. Okay. So one opening behind the eye orbit. Now, uh, archosaurs, so kind of moving on into the diapsid line and exploring the diapsid line. We're not going to spend much time in the anapsid line because they're not very important. But the diapsid line is very important, and the synapsid line is very important because diapsid gave us lizards, snakes, birds, crocodiles, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs. Synapsids gave us mammals, okay, so we want to learn about them too. So, um, archosaurs. Moving on to archosaurs. Archosaurs are a type of diapsid. Okay. Um, crocodiles came from the archosaur group. So they were present in the early Triassic and they were the predecessors to the dinosaurs, birds, flying reptiles, <coughs> and the crocodiles. So this is what an early Triassic archosaur would have looked like. So you can see they kind of look like a cross right between a crocodile and a dinosaur or something like that. Now the dinosaurs <clears throat> came from the um, archosaur group. And we have the um, Saurischian and the Ornithischian type groups of dinosaurs. And it's based upon um, the morphology of the hip. The hip is either bird-hipped or lizard-hipped. So this is the Saurischian pelvis, hip, hip bone. This is the Ornithischian, Ornithischian pelvis, okay? So it means lizard-hipped or bird-hipped. So Stegosaurus, you know, was a ornithish, ornithischian, um, something like uh, the Therosaurs. These were all like the T-Rex and like raptors and things. They were all um, Saurischians. So Saurischian dinosaurs include the theropods and the sauropods. Okay, sauropods were those like long-necked dinosaurs. Okay, so all the long-necked dinosaurs, you know, like, you know, Brachiosaurus and brontosaurus, things like that. Those are all part of the sauropod family. The theropods are all of like those big predatory um, dinosaurs that stand on two legs. So things like, you know, T-Rex were theropods, okay? The um, or ornithischians were things like, we had four main groups. We had the ceratopsians, okay? Things like triceratops, but there were actually a lot of different ceratopsians, not just triceratops. There was many different groups. Um, the ankylosaur group, Okay, that's you've probably seen these ones before. They have the big club tail and the big armored uh, skin. Um, the Stegosaurus, I'm sure you've seen those guys before. And the um, um, Ornithopods. Now, the Ornithopods are things like the um, kind of like the duck billed dinosaurs or like iguanodons. Okay, so there you go. From the Archosaurs, we break off into the Dinosaur, um, Dinosauria, right? And we have um, Ornithischians and Saurischians. Okay, so Saurischians, you have the sauropods, long-necked dinosaurs, and you have the theropods, which were these two-legged things like T-Rex, um, Ornithischians, right, Stegosaurus, you have the Ceratopsians. You, know, you also had these uh, Marginocephalia, which were the, um, they were the, what do you call them, like the um, hard-headed, like the guys that butt heads. Um, they had like really thick, like pachyderms, they had like really thick skulls. Um, and you had also the um, ornithopods that were things like, like I said, like duckbills, iguanodons, things like that. Okay. Um, so there you go. These are the sauropod dinosaurs. They include the largest land mammals to ever exist. They are not the, did I say mammals? Sorry. The largest land 
animals to ever exist. Not obviously not mammals. Um, we have the theropods, which include things like the ancestors to birds. Okay, um, things like T-Rex and raptors. Okay, those were theropods. Uh, this stunning fossil is uh, Archaeopteryx. This is from the late Jurassic. And you can see this is the earliest known fossil of something, you know, very much resembling a bird. You can actually see the feathers. And it's pretty amazing because if we did not see the feathers on this animal, we would have had no idea it had feathers, right? And, we, and feathers, you can imagine that feathers aren't usually preserved in the rock record. So we would have looked at this and said, okay, this is like, you know, every other, this just looks like, <clears throat> you know, every other, um, every other uh, theropod dinosaur. Um, but it's actually, right, like the beginning of birds. So, um, so birds came from the theropod lineage, which is ironically a Sorchician, not an or um, Ornithischian, right? Ornithischian means bird-hipped. So uh, we have uh, the group Marginocephalia, which includes the Ceratopsians, right? The Triceratops included, and the Pachycephalosaurus, right? So these are Pachycephalosaurus, Pac means thick, Cepha means head. So um, these are like thick-headed, thick-skulled uh, creatures here that we don't really know what this this was used for. As a matter of fact, it's actually kind of interesting. I was watching like a, a show about um, you know what this head was for, and it's actually mysterious because. When everyone saw this at first, they just assumed that this this big thick skull was for like butting heads like a ram, like you know, like a modern day like mountain goat or something like that. But actually they find that this this skull is actually very spongy tissue. It's spongy, kind of like very porous um, skull tissue, bone tissue. So it would not have been good for high impacts. It actually like would have would have crumbled. So um, some people are saying maybe it's just kind of a sexual dimorphism thing. You know, it's not it's not clear. So this is kind of interesting show I watched about that. But anyway, um, Ornithischians, Stegosaurus was another group, right? These platy lizards. Uh, Ankylosaurus was yet another group. These are ones with the kind of thick back um, um, club-like tail, right? Kind of look like an ancient armadillo or something like that. And the um, Orinthopods, which were these like duckbill dinosaurs and and iguanodons and things like that, these guys. So um, that's that's you know basically all the all the dinosaur groups which went extinct at the end of the um, at the end of the Cretaceous. So we also had pterosaurs um, during this time. I like this guy. This is um, Quetzal Quetzalcoatlus. So this was like a gigantic pterosaur. I mean, it was really huge. Um, I don't show it. I should show it in like re in relativity to something else. But I mean, like this guy is like as tall as a giraffe. I mean, he's like truly, truly a gigantic, gigantic lizard. Um, so it's pretty crazy. Um, another group of diapsids also include the marine reptiles. So again, they're distinct from dinosaurs. So uh, we have the ichthyosaurus. By the way, we these aren't dinosaurs, right? Like this isn't a dinosaur. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. They're, they're totally separate groups. So they went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, just like the dinosaurs, but they're totally different groups of animals. So these are marine reptiles. Um, Ichthyosaurus was totally marine. And it's kind of funny because after so many years of evolution, trying, struggling as rep, you know, to break away from the oceans and get onto land and reproduce on land, you have this problem now of, okay, I'm a reptile, how do I reproduce in the water again? So um, it's hard, you can't lay eggs like fish do. So when you're a marine reptile like this, you can't, you know, you can't lay like a chicken egg like the dinosaurs would have. You have to, you have to give birth to live young. So probably Ichthyosaurus probably gave birth to live young, okay? Because it would have been impossible for this creature to get up onto land. Now, um, another another group of uh, marine reptiles this time, which were kind of like almost similar to whales are now. Um, like I said, reptiles were on top of the world back then, so we don't have mammals coming to dominance. So right, these niches are now filled by mammals, right? So this would be like the equivalent of a dolphin 
these would be equivalent to like whales, you know, the Mosasaurus. So these were mostly marine, but they could probably now, of course, and by the way, these are all air breathing, right? They don't, they don't have gills. They don't breathe the water. Um, but these guys probably came up onto land, maybe to lay eggs. Okay. So these probably gave birth to live young. These ones probably laid eggs on land as well as these plysosaurs. We think that they probably were able to kind of scoot up onto land and lay, lay their eggs kind of like a, um, you know, a seal does today. I don't think we have any niche that is like this now. You know, we don't have any creature like this now that has this long neck. It's kind of interesting. But anyway, um, those are the plysosaurs, mosasaurs, and ichthyosaurs. Those were the marine reptiles, okay? So now let's turn over to the synapsid line. So the synapsid line, of course, gave way to eventually people, okay? So we want to understand them. So we broke off, right, from rep, the rest of the reptiles, uh, rest of the amniotes very early on. So we had amniota, the first amniotes. Uh, we've split off from synapsids and the um, anapsids and diapsids, right? So synapsids had that one orbit. Do you see how there's one orbit there? Sorry, there's one opening behind the orbit, the main eye orbit. So that's a synapsid skull. So I'm gonna show you on the test, by the way, I'm gonna show you skulls, pictures of skulls. I'm gonna say, which is a synapsid, which is an anapsid, and which is a therapsid, right? And, or, a, sorry, a diapsid. And you need to tell the difference based on the number of openings behind the skull, okay? Um, so the synapsids broke off and gave us the therapsids. Okay, and we'll go over to some of those things. And therapsids, eventually gave rise to what are called cynodontia. Cyno means dog, canine-like, dog-like. Dontia means um, teeth, so it had dog-like teeth, okay? So uh, the cynodonts were kind of the first mammals. Um, they were, would have been kind of a transitionary species or transitionary group between um, the between the reptiles and the mammals, okay? So here in this picture, they're shown very, looking very mammal-like, okay? So this would have been in the late Triassic, we start to see mammals, okay? So um, just some differences um, between uh, kind of changes that happen to the skull transitioning from reptile to mammal, okay? So 300 million years ago, so this is at the late Permian, we had the synapsids. These were things, like I said, like pelicosaurs, very like those ray fin. Remember the pelicosaurs were like these ray finned, like um, dimatron, like these uh, had the big rays on their backs, big spines on their backs. Um, oh, sorry. These guys, right? Dimitrodon, right? These guys had the spines on their backs. So um, synapsids, late Permian. Take a look at, again, the opening behind the orbit, the main eye orbit, okay? There's one opening, that's a synapsid. Um, now I want you to pay attention to how these three certain bones change. So this purple bone is the squamosal. This is, by the way, the bone that gets really large on a triceratops that creates the frill, okay? Um, so there's the squamosal bone. Let me get the ink off here. There's the squamosal bone shown in purple. There's this green um, quadrate bone. And then there's the articular bone right here. And another thing I want you to notice is this, this bone right here, this is the dentary. Okay, so you're gonna see some, um, you're gonna see some big changes here as we switch from synapsids, or I should say transition from synapsids to mammals, okay? These, you're, first of all, you're gonna see the skull get much more simple. Instead of having all these different bones, um, you're gonna see it kind of just simplify and you're gonna have less bones composing the skull. And these three bones, believe it or not, the, the squamosal, the um, articular, and the dentary are gonna to start to be part of, they've now kind of, in, our, in us and other mammals, those things have disappeared and become part of our ear bones. So now they're used completely in the little bones that are in our ears, okay, which are used for hearing. So you'll also notice what's gonna happen is the dentary. You're gonna go from having four different bones composing the lower jaw into one. And, the, and you know, so, so in early reptiles, 
um, you have four different bones composing the lower jaw. It's now in us, you know, we have a jaw bone, right? You have one, one bone that is your jaw, okay? So you're gonna see that transition as we go to mammals, okay? So as you, you go from synapsids to therapsids, okay, things kind of look basically the same. Again, you see therapsids, there's one orbit, behind, one, one opening behind the, um, by the way, these are called fenestrae, which mean windows. Uh, fenestrae, one fenestrae between, behind the orbit there. Okay, uh, going to the early cyanodonts. Okay, so this is the very beginning of the Triassic. Okay, we see kind of the same things. There's the fenestrae right there. There's the, fen or fenestra, right? That's the little opening that's behind the orbit. Okay, later cyanodonts. So now this is in the Triassic still. Now you can see that the dentary has totally taken over the jaw. Okay, the other bones of the jaw have basically disappeared. And you can see the squamosal um, you know, still playing a large part, but you can see the articular and quadrate becoming smaller and smaller as they are articulated into the, um, into the uh, ear bones, okay? Now you can see by the time we get to late cyanodonts, which is basically at the early Jurassic, now you can see that it's, looked, it's a, basically a mammal skull, okay? Um, the dentary has totally taken over. It's the main jawbone. You have a squamosal here, and then the hinge and uh, articular and quadrate bones are now part of the ear. Okay, you can't even see them anymore. One last uh, thing I want to show you here, because this, again, this is stuff you got to know for the test. I'm going to ask you specific questions about differences in the skull between mammals and reptiles. Take a look at the teeth. Okay, teeth are going to become specialized uh, for the mammals. So reptiles have basically all the same kind of tooth. Okay, all their teeth are, they're mostly the same. They don't have a lot of different specialization in their teeth. As we go from the synapsids, therapsids, cynodonts, and then to the mammals, you're gonna see the teeth become more and more specialized and different. Okay, you see how much diversity there is in the teeth compared to the synapsid line. Okay, so early mammals, this is just showing the, the articular and hinge bone, you know, the, um, those smaller bones becoming part of the ear bones there. Um, another thing I, oh yeah, uh, along with the teeth, reptile teeth usually only have, have one root, whereas, uh, whereas uh, mammal bones, mammal teeth, sorry, are uh, cyanodonts, dog toothed, they have double roots, okay? So they're more differentiated, they're more complicated, they're more complex, and they have double roots. So that's the difference between mammal teeth and reptile teeth. Um, so by the middle of the Jurassic, we definitely had mammals emerging. Most of these mammals were pretty small. You know, they're kind of like mouse squirrel sized. Uh, some were getting large though. So there was this one, um, Repnomamus gigantic, uh, giganticus, um, which is, you know, about one meter in size. So it kind of looked like a big badger maybe. Um, so we have both uh, fossils of this that show that it had hair and also all the characteristic um, kind of bone structure, bone morphology of a mammal, okay? So um, the first mammals, just kind of give you an idea what they were like, uh, were like reptiles. They were closer to reptiles. Uh, if you want to get a good idea what early mammals looked like, you should take a look at the modern day monotremes, okay? Monotremes, uh, another name for them is prototheria. Theria means beast. Proto, again, means beginning, so these were the beginning beasts, okay? So monotremes, um, we have modern day, modern day monotremes are uh, things like the uh, uh, platypus, duckbill platypus, and the echidna, okay? So um, the first mammals were probably like that. Um, and the, you'll see that they're actually like a transition between reptile and mammal. They have some reptile characteristics, but also some mammal characteristics. But they're definitely mammals, okay? Monotremes are definitely mammals. Um, the metatheria, which are middle beasts, are the marsupials. They, uh, okay, we'll go into the difference between marsupials and, and kind of placental mammals later. And now most mammals today, except for in Australia, 
are placentals. Okay, so these have long gestational periods, shorter lactational periods, and uh, we'll, we'll go into all that. So most, most mammals now are placental mammals. So first of all, let's look at our monotremes. Monotremes are pretty cool. They are um, kind of like I said, a cross between a reptile and a mammal. Um, what you see here are the platypus here. So there's the platypus and there's the echidna. So um, some of the differences between these kinds of mammals and mammals we think of today, uh, some kind of unusual things is that both these mammals lay eggs. So that's pretty weird, right? They don't give birth to live young. They lay eggs like an amniotic egg, just like a, a bird would, okay? Uh, they don't have the typical like um, sexual reproductive organs that you and I have. Uh, they have um, they have a cloaca, um, which are kind of basically what chickens have or birds have, okay? Um, so they don't do internal, you know, uh, fertilization. So um, that's another kind of reptile like, you know, birds and, and a lot of reptiles have cloaca. So that they're doing reproduction like reptiles. Um, also another thing, these are venomous. I don't know about the spiny anteater, but the platypus is the only venomous mammal. So they had venom like many reptiles do, right? You think of snakes and Gila monsters and things like that. They all have, they all have uh, venom. So anyway, um, like I said, it, they're weird, and you can just look at them. I mean, they're they're weird looking, right? They're very very weird looking. Um, you know, in, in the years when uh, Australia was being uh, discovered to the Western world, uh, you know, it was the existence of these creatures was just not believed. You know, by you know, until they were actually viewed by modern science. You know, because they seemed like such mythological creatures, right? Because they're a mix between reptile and mammal but that's because they came so early on okay so uh just kind of give you an idea of the breakdown of of different mammal groups you can see there's a lot of them and the main point i want to make here is that uh you know during the triassic okay we had some mammals we had a little bit of diversification the triassic we split split up between the monotremes and the marsupials Okay, a little bit more diversification in the Jurassic. We got the we got the marsupials splitting up, and we got the beginnings of the placental mammals splitting up. Then Cretaceous, getting some more diversification in the Cretaceous. But then look at this: the KT mass extinction happens, and mammals just explode. You get all the every single one of these blue squares represents a diversification event. So they split splitting and radiating and just exploding. I mean, it's just crazy. So um, the last group to evolve and split off were um, the primates. So they're, you know, and we're part of that group as well, the primate group, um, as well as um, Dernoptera. This is a weird group of animals. I'm gonna show you some pictures of these things later, but uh, kind of earliest so kind of like the most latest and most advanced mammal hey you're looking at it right now right it's humans primates are kind of the latest and most advanced along with also by the way um probopsidia which is the elephants probos means nose by the way and uh hyrocidia which is i'm going to show you another group of these guys the hyrocidia um it's actually the closest living relative or one of the close i shouldn't say closest but one of the closest living relatives to the elephant is, you won't believe it, I'll show you, it's the Hyrex. But anyway, um, that's just kinda, you know, the main point here is, wow, look at the amount of diversification that happened right at the end of the Cretaceous with the KT mass extinction. It opened up, you know, with the dinosaurs going out of business, it just opened up all of this new, new niches for mammals to fulfill and mammals just really rose to the challenge. So um, at this time we had the placental marsupial divergence. Okay. So uh, in the, in the Mesozoic, we got a, uh, we got the advent of not only mammals, but we got placental mammals versus um, marsupial mammals. So the oldest known placental mammal is about 125 
million years ago that would have put it in the Jurassic. Okay. Um, and it would have looked something like this, which looks a heck of a lot like a possum, which makes sense because possums are marsupials, right? So, but these were truly placental animals. Okay. Now um, we're going to end here. I know it's a lot of information to go off, but uh, we're going to talk a lot about the story of mammals. It's going to continue next week. We're going to talk about Cenozoic geology first. And uh, by the way, because the Cenozoic is so much shorter than the mess, so, so much shorter than the like Paleozoic and things, I don't as, have as much to say. So it should be a shorter lecture on Cenozoic geology. And then we're going to finish the story of um, Cenozoic life. And basically, I mean the story of mammals. We're going to end it with Cenozoic life. And then after that, we only have one more lecture. And that one more lecture is on humans and where humans come from, at least. I can say where our bodies come from, where we as animals come from. But um, that's all, and that's going to be the class. We'll all be all done. So we only have, I think, three more lectures after this. So uh, anyway, I'll let you go, and I hope you have a good weekend.